Welcome to the American Monetary Association's podcast, where we explore how monetary policy impacts the real lives of real people and the action steps necessary to preserve wealth and enhance one's lifestyle. Welcome to the podcast for the American Monetary Association. This is your host, Jason Hartman, and this is a service of my private foundation, the Jason Hartman Foundation. Today, we have a great interview for you, so I think you'll enjoy it and comment on our website or our blog post. We have a lot of resources there for you, and you can find that at AmericanMonetaryAssociation.org. That's AmericanMonetaryAssociation.org, or the website for the foundation, which is JasonHartmanFoundation.org. Thanks so much for listening, and please visit our website and enjoy our extensive blog and other resources there. Let's welcome John Stapleford to the show. He's a senior economist at Moody'sEconomy.com and comes to us from, uh, are you from Pennsylvania today? Uh, yes. Fantastic. He is also a professor emeritus of economic development at Eastern University and former director of the University of Delaware's Bureau of Economic Research. John holds a PhD in urban and regional economics from the University of Delaware and a master's degree from the University of Southern Illinois. John, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jason. Glad to be here. It's great to have you on. Talk to us a little bit about the outlook from uh, Moody'sEconomy.com, if you would. Well, I, I think we're, if you look at the, the most recent scenario from the uh, President's Budget Advisor and the Office of Management and Budget, we're tracking along pretty similarly. We, we see the turning point. Turning point in output will occur sometime before the end of this year, but the turning points in employment and income and some of the other areas of the economy won't occur until next year. And then as they're projecting, once you pass the turning point, because this has been such a long and steep recession, it's going to take a good long while to get back up to the levels of activity that you had before the recession. So many are hailing that we're in a recovery mode now. If you turn on CNBC, they're cheering the new comeback in the Dow and so forth and, and the different markets. What are your thoughts? Well, I'm glad the Dow's coming back because it means if I did want to retire, I could. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, there, there's some signs that the that little shoots of uh, grass are breaking through the the dry ground. I think it's going to take longer than some people, some of the optimists might think. But when you look at things like the unemployment rate, we think the unemployment rate is still going to go up and, and hit over 10% at the, the peak level in the United States. On any of these economic indicators, for your listeners, just so they're absolutely clear on this, all the things you read about the economy are based on sample data. That means that around any of these data points, whether it's an unemployment rate or the growth rate in GDP or consumer confidence, it's based on sample data and it has a confidence interval around it. So month-to-month changes really don't mean much. You really need to look at change over three or four months. And then, in addition, if you're looking at something like, let's say, the unemployment rate, you need to look at four or five other labor market characteristics to really get the full picture, like what's happening with initial claims for unemployment insurance, what's happening to the number of discouraged workers, what's happening to the number of people who are working part-time for economic reasons. So it's an important thing to keep in mind, you know, the fact that the unemployment rate dropped from 9.5% to 9.4% between June and July in the United States, it, it really is insignificant. And in fact, what had happened was the labor force declined because the discouraged workers, the, the population of discouraged workers increased. And so the total number of people who were unemployed fell, but not because they found jobs. It's because they just dropped out of the labor force. Right. And I know that the discouraged worker part of that plan that, that fell off, that was changed the way they count that statistic under Clinton, I believe, where if it's over one year, you're no longer counted. So someone could be very seriously unemployed, becoming absolutely destitute, and they're not counted as unemployed. Is that how that works? That's a really good observation. And I'd have to go back and look at the their current definition. But I, I would be aghast to think that politicians would manipulate data to make themselves look better. <laughs> this takes me aback. Of course, you're, that's a, a sarcastic comment for sure. Oh, right? God, no, no, I mean, absolutely not. No, I, <laughs> I, as you get older, you more and more realize how uh, disposable politicians are. Yeah. <laughs> 
Fair enough. I'm going to agree with you on that one for sure. So the other thing that I've always been very concerned about when you look at unemployment rates is the underemployed. And the joke in California, which is sort of the subprime mortgage capital of the country, is that the mortgage broker who used to be making $40,000 a month is now working at Starbucks and delivering your pizza. There's no real way to tally the underemployed, is there? Well, there is. And, And the way I do it, when I look at metropolitan areas or states, I look at wages and personal income. And wages, of course, are a part of personal income. And this whole thing is complicated, not only by the underemployment that you refer to, but by these furloughs. There's many people who are getting two-week furloughs, which you know amounts to like a 4% pay cut. So they're in the unemployment rate. They don't show up because they're still, quote, employed. But in fact, they show up in the wage bill. In other words, the wage component of personal income starts growing a lot more slowly than it had been in in previous years, which affects disposable income, which affects consumption, which affects retail trade and automobile sales and so forth. So to me, a more accurate way of tracking things is, uh, is wages. And the other part of it, Jason, that people don't realize is if you're working at Macy's or large retail store and you're working 15 hours a week, in the unemployment data, you're counted as employed. Right. In other words, they don't adjust jobs to full-time equivalent. And so that's another reason I tend to lean towards wages. Like retail typically is around 12% of employment, but it's only about 7% or 6% of, of total wages in any particular area. Yeah, and the, just to, not to harp on the unemployment statistic here, but you know the other one that's always concerned me is the, the fact that people are comparing today to the Great Depression. And they're saying things like, during the Great Depression, unemployment got up to 25% at, at the worst point. And today, it's, it's much lower. So things really aren't that bad. Bad. I agree that in many ways they're not that bad. However, I'd also like to just take a look at the concept of the independent contractor, the sort of free agent, the freelancer, whether it be in the real estate or mortgage business, big industries like that, or it be, you know, the graphic designer who works out of their house and is just doing contract work here and there, but they'd really much rather have a real corporate job and have what I would consider full employment, running a real estate business myself for the past 12 years. I've seen independent contractors that make very little or no money for long stretches of time on on commission only, yet they're not counted as unemployed. Sure. Now, the proportion of employed folks in the United States who are self-employed has actually been relatively stable over the last five years. It it has shifted from agriculture over into lots of other things, you know, into the services area. But but you're right. The and, And then how much do you like paying the FICA for both yourself and for yourself as an employer. Right, two times, <laughs> yes. like giving up 13% of your, of your money just right off the bat. Well, that's pretty fair. Yeah, you know? yeah. no, I know. I know. <laughs> no, no, you're, you're, you, you make a good point. And I, I, would, I guess I, I would say as well, uh, we have built into our economy today things that, that didn't exist back in 1929, 1930, like the unemployment insurance that are counter-cyclical. Unemployment insurance is one, but there's food stamps, there's just a whole series of things that help to stabilize the economy that weren't around before. And, and, and one other aspect of this, you know, we had talked about wages and personal income, transfer payments, which is Social Security, Medicare, and then some other things, Medicaid too, has gone from, oh, around 12% of personal income 15 years ago, it's up to close to 18% of personal income or a little bit over today across the United States. Well, you know, one aspect of that is it smooths out the business cycle. That money, regardless of whether people are, you know, unemployed or employed or whatever, that money is still flowing out and it's flowing out to all the states. The downside of it is, I guess it's reasonable to the question, how long how long can you just transfer money from one group to another without killing the economy? But nevertheless, the transfer, the whole transfer payment system wasn't around uh, 60, 70 years ago. Right. And the takeaway I'd like listeners to get from my comment in the comparison of unemployment to the Great Depression is that back then, which you alluded to, but I just want to make it clear, we really didn't have all the independent contractors. People had more traditional industrial era jobs at that time, right? Right. And I'm not an expert on the data, but I, I find it very hard to believe that the data that we have today is in any way comparable to what they had then. I, I'm i sure they they were just getting started on tracking all these things. And so 
Now, another factor in here, Jason, I mean, there's lots of factors you could talk about, but is, is married women in the labor force. And married women in the labor force just started accelerating in the 1970s and hit an all-time high a few years ago. That really wasn't a major factor back in the 1930s. And so, you know, one of the questions is, if somebody is unemployed, are they the primary wage earner in the household or are they a secondary wage earner? And if they're a secondary wage earner, it still hurts, but it's not as serious as a primary wage earner losing both their income, you know, their earnings, and their benefit package. So a lot of confounding factors that make it difficult to, in my mind, to make a comparison. Sure. Yeah, that's a very good point. I remember looking through William Bennett's book, The Leading Index of Cultural Educator, uh, Cultural right, Indicators, right. sorry, not educators. And one of the interesting points in there, as I recall, and this was years ago I was looking at it, is that both the husband and wife had to be working to support the household as you got into the 70s and 80s because the tax burden increased so much, whereas before the tax burden was much lower and, and other costs were lower too. It's sort of hard to make sense of that. I mean, I, you're, you're right. I, I don't know what to think of that or, or take away well, from that. I mean, one, one factor in there, because the I've looked in pretty close detail at the uh, black family and the black family, the labor force participation rate for black males used to be equal to white males. And the black family up through 1950 was still mostly married couple families. And the black out of wedlock birth rate is now up around 70% of all births are out of wedlock, which means, which doesn't bode well for the portion of black children who are going to grow up in, in uh, married couple families. And, you know, there's Two factors are driving that. One of is the Great Society programs, which you know really took the steam out of the role of, of the black male and and the importance of being in the labor market. So the black male labor force participation rate has plummeted with that. And then in addition, over this last at least 30 years, as we talked about, black males have been competing against married white females coming into the labor market. So they've been you know they've been hit from from two sides. And there is a, a third factor, which of course is that the pool of marriageable black males is very low compared to marriageable white males in other words, single and employed full time because more black men have been killed or they have a higher mortality rate. But in addition, they have a lower labor force participation rate. There's more discouraged workers as you had mentioned previously, and there's more that are incarcerated. So you take all those things together and you end up with not a complete breakdown, but a really rapid loss of, of the proportion of black children and married couple families. And all the research literature, whether it's liberals or conservatives doing the research, says growing up in a single parent family uh, is not the greatest thing for children. Yeah, I would certainly agree with that. One of the things that's interesting about that, even cutting across racial lines, is the aid to families with dependent children. And you've just got to wonder if the government and sort of the great society programs you mentioned have incentivized the breakup of the nuclear family. Have, have they done that through the tax tax program, you know, through fiscal policy? Well, the you always look in, at incentives at the margin, and you have to assume that people are rational. And initially, the Great Society programs and AFDC in the early 1970s, and when you took the whole package with Medicaid and food stamps and Section 8 housing and, you know, go down the list, you actually would have needed at that time like a $13, $14 an hour job to be equal to that package. Uh, now, then it got slowly cut back over time. And of course, they had the temporary, the, the welfare reform. And when you say, well, what's this providing an incentive to people? You know, the welfare reform, and these numbers are close, they may not be right on target, but before welfare reform, I think we had around 14 million people in the welfare system, you know, AFDC. Afterwards, we're down to around 3 million. When you have that kind of drop in the population of folks on welfare, just because you're putting requirements on like you have to stay in school or you have to work. It, it must mean there were people who were taking advantage of, of that system. Well, that's the that's the problem with government programs is that everybody starts looking for the loopholes and the ways to sort of exploit the system. I mean, we just got through this cash for clunkers things and on both sides of the aisle, you know, the car dealerships are complaining. And Well, you know, Jason, the, if you look at congressional budget office reports on things like the earned income tax credit report or food stamps, typically about a third of the payments given are fraud, okay? And I'm sure Medicare is the same way. I think that applies across the income distribution. In other words, I, th I think 
think high income people, about a third of them are ripping the government off. And I think middle income people, probably about a third. I think there's probably a relatively constant corruption factor. And it just comes from the fact that, uh, hey, we live in a fallen world and that's human nature. So you've got to expect it. And the only thing you can do is to design the programs as carefully as you can to try to minimize the fraud. You'll never get rid of it. Right. You'll never get rid of it. There's a huge black market for, for food stamps, for example. You know, So you say, well, you can't buy liquor with your food stamps. Well, they sell the food stamps, get the money, and buy liquor or drugs. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the same is true since we kind of focus on the housing angle. If you look at rent control programs that have been done in various cities in California and, and New York and so forth, and it always gives rise to this gray market or totally black market where people are doing deals under the table. You know, there was even a Seinfeld episode about it where uh, you know where jerry's neighbor died this older lady that lived in his apartment and you know elaine wanted to rent the place and they were doing payoffs and t- <laughs> it's ridiculous oh, it, uh, it's the other thing too is that in cities where they have rent control or expensive rent control homelessness increases yeah because you know, the, the incentives of rent control are number one if you're the landlord you don't maintain your unit number two if you're a developer you don't put up new rental units because, of course not. you know, you can't get the market price. And so the supply of housing actually goes down over time and homelessness increases. Adam Smith's contention was that people are self-interested. He, he didn't say self-interest is good. He just said, hey, that's the way people are. Right. And from a Judeo-Christian perspective, that's the same position that the Bible takes. It says, well, you know, people are fallen and... Uh, Find a way to deal with it. Don't expect people to act like saints. Right, right. There's a few exceptions, you know, like uh, probably you, but... uh, Right, (laughs) there you go. Sure. Yeah, and then so that's that's the inv- invisible hand, as, uh, as Smith described it, right? Talk to us a little bit about the housing market, if you would, knowing that all real estate is local and that markets differ greatly across the nation. And your thoughts on, on Case Schiller. I noticed that on the Moody'sEconomy.com website, you've got a very prominent link talking about Case Schiller. There's been some debate about the accuracy, and, you know, nothing is perfect, of course. And I remember listening to one BBC program where there was a, a person representing Case Schiller and, and someone representing another index, and, you know, they were kind of debating the merits of each. I, I both both had an argument, really, I, I thought. I have to say, Jason, I, I, I don't think the problem today is a lack of data. I, I think the problem is a lack of conceptual frameworks. I mean, the reason the housing bust occurred and the bubble occurred and the reason for this housing correction is the complete absence of, of the application of a, of a very basic uh, housing market economic framework to what was going on. So, you know, is the case still right? All, all of them have their limitations, as you had said. The, the multi-listing, for example, you're only picking up the housing houses that are moving, and right now, at least a third of those houses are foreclosures. So what does that do to your data? You know, what does that do to the average price that you have in data that's based on the multi-list? And, you know, you look at, uh, uh, if your listeners are familiar to, like, Zillow, I mean, do, do you really believe that down at the zip code level or the neighborhood level or the census block level, whatever, that that we have accurate data on what's happening with the housing market. I mean, if we did, why do we pay people to do uh, assessments? You know, why do we pay realtors to go out and tell us what the market value of our our house is? I think the more important thing is, is the conceptual framework that allows you to figure out the big picture. Okay. And when I say that, I mean, what are the four or five factors that drive the demand for housing? And what are the four or five factors that drive the supply of housing? And what's happening to those things? And it's it, absolutely clear when you look at those factors back in 2004, 2005, and we were talking about this at economy.com, the demographics weren't there for the tremendous run up in house prices. I mean, they weren't there. You didn't have a baby boom coming into the housing market. Uh, it was all based on easy money. Yeah, I, I would call it a mortgage induced housing boom or a, <laughs> you know or a uh, federal reserve induced housing boom you know it's uh, say, uh, or mihb yep <laughs> yeah but you're yeah you're you're exactly right but but not many people stood back from it even some of the quote experts said oh well you know it's just have uh, people really value their housing and there's a huge federal subsidy of housing because you can write off your mortgage interest and and so forth and, and real income is rising but Really, real income wasn't rising that rapidly, and interest rates weren't that low, you know, underneath the whole thing. Yeah, it, it, the, the factors weren't there, and, and like the rate of withdrawal of housing from the housing stock because of deterioration or whatever is very, very steady. 
you know, over time. The rate of renovation rehabilitation is very steady. And so if the demographics, if you don't have net in migration, and then from coastal California, you actually had net out migration, oh, uh, sure. particularly of older people. You, you have it in Florida now, too, by the way. Yeah, I have just it in saw Florida a now, too. But you know, even before the bubble burst in California that was going on, as people were looking for lower cost of living areas, like in Bakersfield or whatever. Well, they and they were, going, they were going to Arizona, Nevada. They were going well, to Arizona, yeah. yeah. Rather than get into hemming and hauling over what's the best, most representative housing data, step back and look at it comprehensively through a sound conceptual framework. That'll get people who are in the real estate industry much further down the line. So give us the points. You said four or five sort of key factors that made up that conceptual framework. Of course, you talked about employment, in and out migration. What are the other ones? Uh, real income, household formation, and of course, the whole the whole demographic thing, which netting migration is part of and housing formation is part of. And when look And looking at the overall labor market because young people who person like me I've been we've been in our house now 20 years and it's unlikely that we'll move until we you know downsize to a condo or a coffin but young people are the ones who are mobile 18 to 29 and they move to dynamic labor markets they don't move for amenities amenities may be a factor in there but elderly people will be more aware of amenities when they move as retirees but young people you know, they're looking for places where if they lose a job, they can find another job quickly. So what's the level, what's the rate of net in-migration? And does the labor market say that this level of in-migration is going to sustain itself or continue? And then what's the income distribution of the people who are coming in? Because more educated people are more mobile than less educated people. And more educated people move to metropolitan areas where there's already a high level of education, you know, which says that those that have will get more and those that don't have won't get it. And the the metropolitan areas in the country that have highly educated labor force are the areas that are are the healthiest. All I'm saying is is a very simple microeconomic demand model. You know, what are the factors that cause a shift in demand, change in population, and that's the household formation and the in migration income prices, the substitutes, the complements. So, you know, of course we keep track of rents in a metropolitan area and if the rents are going up rapidly, that would encourage people to think about shifting over to uh, ownership. You know, inflation, uh, can you buy a house and, and will it appreciate? Uh, and then the regulations as a government, you know, will government ever, one of the largest subsidies the federal government gives out is for owner-occupied housing. And will that sooner or later come under attack? And that's the home mortgage interest deduction you're referring to, right? Home mortgage interest and property tax deduction. Yeah, the two of them together, it's, it's huge. I, I think the last time I looked, it might have been $130 billion. And uh, it, it would be very hard to touch it. But they may, you know, they may say any mortgage amount up to $100,000, the interest is deductible and above that it's not, you know, or they may fiddle with it. But I, I don't think they're going to get to that point. I mean, I remember years ago in, in California, well, it wasn't California per se, but it applied particularly to California and other expensive areas. They limited it at $1 million in mortgage amount. And so, you know, if you're in the high, high upper end and you're looking at a $4 million property, you can't deduct that whole mortgage. Uh, yeah. anymore. But that's such a sacred cow. I mean, there's just too many voters that own homes. You know, I mean, and you're right, Jason, but also you would have the National Association of Home Builders coming after you. You'd have all the the, the National Association of Realtors, you know, you'd have the Realtors, National Association, you know, you'd have. And like it or not, this subsidy has made residential construction a very significant part of our economy in the United States. Sure, so you'd yeah. also be messing with the underpinnings of, and when you look, like I was, I was looking at uh, the DuPont company, for example, you know, when the housing industry goes bust and the automobile industry goes bust, the DuPont company really hurts because they sell a lot of fiber for carpeting and they sell Tyvek and, you know, right. you go down the list of things. And there's so many ancillary businesses that are oh, affected and that's why housing is so important, obviously. You know. Yeah, there have been a lot of, a lot of people who would, who would be feeling the feeling the pain. Absolutely. And I just wanted to mention on your on your earlier comment in, in this salvo, when you talk about those dynamic cities, those employment cities, Richard Florida uh, wrote a book called The Rise of the Creative Class. And, you know, we kind of refer to those around here as the creative class cities, Denver, Austin, you know, those are two examples of markets that we think are pretty interesting for investors right now. And they're creative class cities, uh, very educated. Um, 
Yeah, it's it's never it foster. He's it, it's an interesting. His two books are very interesting. Yeah, Foster's interesting books, concept. It's never been proven empirically, and it's been tested three or four times. And if you look at his books, the data is a bunch of scatter diagrams. It's not statistical tests of relationships. It's more the the real, you know. And I think it appeals to some people because they say, you know, kind of nerdy oddball people who do strange things. Boy, we really need them. I mean, they're a source of innovation and growth. Well, what you need is people with human capital. And human capital, and this is confirmed again and again in the economic literature, human capital is not just formal education, you know, the bachelor's degree plus. It's also the years that you've spent in a particular occupation. And the demand has to be there for this type of work. So you look at, as you had mentioned, Austin, I mean, you've got a lot of uh, high-tech biochemical, computer and the areas of the country that are doing well are loaded up on human capital. I mean, San Francisco, in the United States, about 26% of the adults have a college degree. San Francisco is up around 41%. Right, but let me interrupt you for a moment here, if I may. Yeah. So my question is there, though, when you're looking at investing, and you're looking at a renter population, and you're looking at in-migration, you also have to look at a place that's affordable to live. And San Francisco is not affordable. And it's got rent control on top of that, you know, so it's got two yeah. really bad things. And taxes are high in California. So when you sort of cut San Francisco and New York, obviously those are world-class cities out of it. Where do you get that highly educated workforce and that sort of kind of dynamics and that human capital element you mentioned for a low price? Yeah, let me come back to that question and, and just jump on, you know, is housing in San Francisco affordable? What the research literature says is when you look at wage levels, if you adjust for the amenities that are in a metropolitan area, if you adjust for the industrial structure, if you adjust for the characteristics of the workers, the cost of living in that metropolitan area will be picked up in the wages. In other words, a high cost area like San Francisco, and you're absolutely right that it's high cost. It's outrageous. <laughs> in fact, you get you get some inflation in wages to compensate for the cost of living. You know, the markets work. Before you go into the next point, can I just ask you a question on that? Yeah. yeah. So the question is, though, not how does the typical San Franciscan afford their $800,000 little tiny condo <laughs> versus the typical Austonian in Austin, I guess I just made up a word, Austonian. How do they afford their $400,000, 4,000-square-foot 4, house on a half acre of land. See, that's a different life, in my opinion. So, you know what I mean? It's not really the same comparison, um, you know, well, because you get a people, you get a different life for that relative cost of living, right? But see, that's your preferences. You think living in no, it's not my preference. I, I live in an no, urban no, area, you know. I know, yeah. but but what I'm saying is, you, somehow you're you're saying, hey, living in a three or four thousand square foot house is more attractive than living in a thousand a thousand foot condo, when in fact in a thousand foot condo you've got, you know, four five star restaurants within two blocks, <laughs> you know, and and people. At least the housing demand literature shows that people recognize these trade-offs. And and the, remember, housing consumption is a bundle of, of amenities and goods and services. It's not just the sticks and stones. It's not just the size of the lot. It's quality of schools. It's access to medical services. It's the crime rate. Oh, you know, absolutely, whole, sure. Yeah, it's so, a whole lifestyle. You know, it's like you it, can't really. You know, you, you could. They they have hedonic price indexes where they try sure. to adjust for all the things that we've mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, and they work okay. But people definitely trade off among the components in the housing bundle. So it, it, it's apples and oranges to some extent to say the. You know, the 1,000-square-foot unit in San Francisco versus the 3,000-square-foot home in, in Austin. Right, but but that's $100 a square foot versus $800 a square foot. Yeah, you know, but you're not, just buying, you're not just buying square feet. I agree with you, you know, completely. You know, in Philadelphia, Jason, there's two kosher vegetarian Chinese restaurants. They don't have that in Austin. Right. Well, well, in Austin they actually do. <laughs> no, well, they don't have kosher, but they have vegetarian for sure. <laughs> but I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure in San Francisco, you there's things that and and am I would that make me move somewhere? No, but it could have an influence on some people. They they could really value that. Look at I'm a single guy. I like urban environments. I you know yeah. I don't like suburbia personally. I'm just saying though, if I had a wife and three kids, 
I couldn't live in that thousand square foot in, in San Francisco. And so do you pay eight times? Is it an eight times multiple to have more swanky dining near your house? I, I, I think there's a point of diminishing return there where people stop paying for it. And then you look at the, the climate of, of the government in a place like San Francisco. And I don't know why we're picking on San Francisco in particular, but <laughs> we, we sort of led there. And, and you know, that sort of the anti-business climate. Yes, there's a lot of innovation, of course, with the tech stuff, but businesses are being pushed out. I see smart, educated people. I'm in Southern California. I see smart, educated people leaving here constantly. It's been going on for years, even, but, even during oh, the yeah, housing but in the case In the case of San Francisco, yeah. and I haven't looked at this exhaustive, but in the case of San Francisco, the only reason it's not growing is because you're out of land. And that's it. Right. People love it there. You know, the people who come there and stay there, they love it. And the amenities are super. It's a beautiful place. Yeah, and no, no all question. Kinds of interesting things. And you know, if if you want to be a complete wacko, nobody will look at you twice. Right. <laughs> uh, but the people who've been leaving California, there, there, I'm sure there are some young people who are then moving to areas where, like Denver and other areas where there's some high tech growing. But for the most part, it's it's people who are in their 50s and older who are looking for a lower cost of living. They're, they may want to continue working for a while, but they've got to get it. You know. It, Remember, we, had, we said the cost of living is reflecting your wages. As you get to the point where you're, either your wages have peaked or you're going to get out of the labor market, you can't sustain the cost of living in San Francisco. You've got to get out of there. Right. You know, your Social Security ain't going to keep up with it. That's so for sure. I, I would say you may know some very smart young people who have moved out, but I'd say for the most part the, the out-migration is, is the people who are moving on their way to get out of the labor market eventually. Yeah, you know, I know that during, I think it was 2005, when the California economy was, uh, well, theoretically booming, it, uh, you know, it was a housing-based economy largely, but we had an out-migration for the first time, I think since the early 90s, of a very small number for a big, huge state like California. It was only about 69,000 people, as I recall. I mean, that's just a drop in the bucket. But the fact that it happened at all was amazing, and I don't know how they do those out-migration stats if they you know, take into account just the net IRS. Okay, IRS and yep, and the post office. Those are the two main sources. Okay, so it doesn't do like if there's a lot of illegal immigration into the state. Uh, it doesn't pick it up and out. Okay, all right, good. So that that's that's better. That I trust the statistic more now that you said that because <laughs> because I thought if they're just looking at a net number and you've got a million that came across the border and then you've got a million and a half that moved out, you know, that's a completely different dynamic, of course, than than we just mentioned. So. Yeah, that's good. Well, they do have people with counters, you know, based on all the major roads. I'm <laughs> kidding. <laughs> You're kidding me. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen those a few times. But the, the IRS, what they do with the IRS data is they can actually tell you of the people who move out of California, where did they go? And of the people who moved into California, where do they come from? And that's some of the data that economy.com we give to clients because they find that really important because it, it's very interesting, Jason. Some metropolitan areas have a a reach that is that is only regional. It's only very close to the metropolitan area in terms of who's moving in and who's moving out. And then other metropolitan areas, you know, like places in Florida, they're going getting people from New York City and Chicago, and, and so it's a different you know different kind of ball game. What do you think uh, into California? Which which state is sending the most people? in absolute in in migration into California. Into California? Mm -hmm. I want to sarcastically say Mexico, but um <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, that's you know, not actually, a state, you, you know. Now when I look at it, you might you might be right because it's Texas is number one and Arizona is number two and Nevada is number three. But that may be you may be picking up uh, Latinos. But over the last year, that you know the data that we have in our system, the net migration for California, there was a, an out migration of. 191,000 folks. Yeah. And, and you know, I remember I was reading an article uh, oh, sometime last year talking about how the number of millionaires up in the Bay Area, well, since we're picking on San Francisco, is, has <laughs> declined fairly substantially. And it wasn't because of the stock market. It wasn't because of anything except the fact that they're moving to Nevada or at least establishing residency there, you know, whatever that right, means, right, uh, right. so that they don't have to pay the state income tax. So there again, you see government screwing things up, in my opinion. But... Well, you know, they <laughs> And you, you know this because you, you work with these people. Why does the government think it can outwit really bright professionals in finance and, and the law when it comes to getting tax money out of rich people? You know, why does it think it can, it can outwit the, the folks who go into the private sector and are working for these types of clients? They, they can't. 
I don't know if they really think they can. I think a lot of it's uh, campaign platitudes and or just bureaucrats that have never had a real job, run a business, made payroll. Sorry to talk about the president that way, but um, <laughs> you know that's that's the reality of our situation. You know, we have people that just they just buy votes is all they're doing. You know, I mean they they look at things as a zero sum game. I mean it just doesn't make any sense. But. No. That's, uh, that's the way it is. But eventually, you know, when they implement things, eventually the results come home to roost and they realize, oh, I actually created more harm than I did good. <laughs> yeah, well, that's why so many of these well-intentioned programs just don't work in real life. They, they just don't. The American Monetary Association is a nonprofit venture funded by the Jason Hartman Foundation, which is dedicated to educating people about the practical effects of monetary policy and government actions on inflation, deflation, and personal freedom. Our goal is to help people prosper in the midst of uncertain economic times. This show is produced by the Jason Hartman Foundation, All Rights Reserved. For publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate professional if you require individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of the Jason Hartman Foundation exclusively.